as I'm sure you're aware, I'm not the normal preacher here. I'm just, every, every last Sunday of the month, uh, the elders have set a time so that one of the men of the congregation can come and lead a lesson. So like Mr. Burns said, tonight we're going to be talking about running the race and how it's going to apply to the Christian walk. So as many of you, as many of you know, I am a runner. I run cross country. I've been doing it since middle school. And over the years, I've learned a few things about running. One is endurance. So that's the first word. If I can see in notebooks, that is cool. I have to admit, that is cool. So like I said, endurance. So as many of you know, if you've ever run long distance before, you know that endurance is key to be able to, be able to withstand the trials and the pain of running a long distance. Secondly, many of, you, many of you may not realize, but teamwork is actually a very big part of running. Whenever you're running long distance, like we'll talk about later in the lesson, having a partner, partner or a group with you will help you to run faster and to be able to run those long distances longer. And lastly, we all know, like it said in verse, in verse 25, the latter part, they do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Ultimately, we want to run so that we can gain that prize, that ultimate prize of heaven. So if you will turn to Psalms chapter 18. Again, that's Psalms chapter 18. So we see here, this is a, a psalm of David. And we see that in, throughout the entire chapter, we see that David is talking about how the Lord is his rock and his fortress and that he can do everything through the Lord. I want to specifically look at verse 29. For by you I can run, run against a troop, and by my God I can leap over a wall. So to begin, we're going to look at the mile race, for example. So there's four laps to a mile race around the track. The first lap, we always see that people are most eager to get out, and this is whenever they're going to run their fastest and their hardest. And we can compare that to somebody who's just been baptized or even our little kids in the church. We see how they're so eager to learn, they're so eager to spread God's word. And then secondly, we see the second lap. This is where everybody is starting to find their own pace and they're all slowing down just a bit. And we can kind of see that with young adults. You see that they're still participating in worship, they're still showing up every day, they're still studying, but you can see they're not as eager to learn. And then this third lap is where it gets a little difficult. The third lap is always your most challenging, your most mentally tough, and this is where you have lactic acid buildup. So if you don't know, lactic acid is an acid that is normally contained in your muscles. You always have lactic acid in your muscles, and what that does is whenever you're training, it will actually break down the muscle so that you can build up new muscle. But during a race, whenever you're running your hardest, you will get what's called lactic acid buildup. This is where you have so much lactic acid that if you've ever ran like a 5K, it's whenever you start, start to feel that cramp, that, that major burn in your legs, and this will actually eat away at your muscle while you're running. And then this last lap, you have the choice to pick it up or to keep the same pace. We see this in all races. Normally people will pick it up and try to finish the race their strongest. And we see this with everybody. You can either give up or you can fail during that race. Let's look at, go back to 1 Corinthians 9.
And let's look at verse 25 again. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable reap, but we an imperishable. So this next part of the lesson is going to be looking about how we need to be training to gain that endurance so that we can ultimately run farther and run faster. So you always will have to train to gain endurance. This training is going to hurt. It's going to be painful. But in the end, this is what's going to be able to get you through that race, and this is what's going to prepare you. It is the most important thing whenever you are running. But how do we, how do we train our minds and our bodies to spread God's word and to become a better Christian? We see that we have to study God's word. 2 Timothy 3.16. Again, that's 2 Timothy 3.16. says, All scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. We see that we have to go to God's word. And we know that is God's word because it plainly states here in the Bible. And then if you will, turn to Joshua chapter 1. Again, that's Joshua chapter 1. This is just after Moses' death and God has been training and Moses has been training Joshua so that he can ultimately lead the Israelites into this promised land. And we see that in, chap in uh, verse 8, he says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate, it on, meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened, and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So we see here, even God, tells, God tell, tells Joshua that we have to be studying in his word and meditating on it day and night. And we do this so that our mind may be strengthened. And then as it says later, that we need to be strong and courageous. This doesn't just need to be whenever we show up here on Sunday or Wednesday. This needs to be an everyday action. And then you're going to have to have endurance to receive the crown of life. We see this in James chapter 1. Again, that's James chapter 1. In verse 2, it says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. Even Paul tells James in, his, in this letter that he has to go through these trials, go through the training of his mind, so that ultimately he will have that steadfastness so that he can eventually get to the crown of life. And if you will turn over just a few pages to Hebrews chapter 10. Again, that's Hebrews chapter 10. For you have no need of endurance. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. Again, the writer of Hebrews is telling us that if we don't have this endurance, we're not going to be able to finish the race. We're going to give up halfway through, and we will not ultimately reach that final goal of heaven. Now, ultimately, training is going to be hard. We see it throughout all these, all these athletes, you see. And we even see it in, in police officers. You know, these police officers go through the training so that ultimately, whenever they have to make that decision, their, their muscle memory kicks in, and so that way they can make the right decision and go off the training that they have. And we need to do the same thing. 
we need to have at muscle memory, so that way, whenever we are faced with a hard situation, we will be able to put out the right product. But we all know that in Romans chapter 5, verse 3 through 5, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. Again, Paul is writing to the Romans, and he keeps on repeating this. We need to have joy in our sufferings. This is going to what this is what's going to help us get to that ultimate goal. And again, like I like I read earlier, James chapter one verse two: Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. But we're not going to be able to get through this training alone, and we're not going to be able to finish this race alone. This is where the aspect of teamwork comes in. Teamwork is so important whenever you're running a race. For example, somebody training for a marathon or an ultra marathon is going to be running 80 to 100 miles every single week. Do you think they're going to be able to do that alone? I know I wouldn't be able to, and I run cross country every single day. <laughs> but they're able to do it with a group and with a partner. This is where the aspect of teamwork comes in. Whenever you're running, especially I know with my teammates, we will run in groups. We will run, during training, we'll run in our groups. And even during races, you will see big groups of the same teams running. And this will help pick each other up and this is what will eventually get us to that end goal. Like I said earlier, you're going to be running faster with a group of people than you are by yourself. I know I've seen it. If you ever try to run by yourself, you will be slow. I'm just going to tell you right now. But with other people, this is where they can push you so that you can run faster. <clears throat> now, there can be a bad aspect of this whenever you are running with a group of people. Say you have, you're running with 10 other people. All nine are saying words of encouragement. They're all encouraging each other. But you have that one person in the group. One person can make such a big impact with their words. They can be saying how hard it is, how hot, they're tired, they're dying, they're in pain. I can go on and on. That will bring the group down, and that is what will help, what, what will slow the group down. Now, I know you don't want to be that person. I don't want to be that person either. So you have to give encouragement. You can't just take it. It's a give and take situation. If you're just taking encouragement, there will, be, there will always be somebody who doesn't have encouragement. This I, I'm going to start calling my buddy system, OK? This is whenever you need to find somebody in the group you're running with. And you talk to them constantly and give them encouragement. So whenever I'm running with my teammates, and we're running on like sidewalk, for say, we always run in pairs. So we will have two, 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 and so forth. If there's one person left over, and we have an odd number. What happens is the last two people will move apart just a bit so that the last person is able to squeeze right in between them, but not knock them over. <clears throat> Hebrews 10, in, the, uh, in verse 25. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now, this idea of stirring up is like you're stirring a fire, and you're stirring up the coals. Whenever you stir up the coals in a fire, it's going to get hotter, it's going to burn hotter, it's going to be bigger. Now, we need to be doing that with one another. That means challenging each other, giving words of encouragement like we just talked about, 
and so forth. First Thessalonians 4. This is where, where is Paul writing to the church of Thessalonica. And he's talking about how this is going to be the coming of the Lord and that we need to still be encouraging each other as we know that this day is ultimately going to be here. And we don't know when it is. So we'll begin in verse 13. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, though Jesus, God, will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, and with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with him and with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. We can see here that Paul is telling them that we need to be looking forward to this day, but that we can't be asleep. We can't be sleeping in. We can't be slacking off. And this is going to relate back to the training. You have to wake up early to run in Texas. It is hot. If you don't, you will most likely pass out. So whenever you're training your mind, you shouldn't be sleeping in mentally, of course. But you need to be always, always awake, always ready to learn, and always willing to learn and to teach others. So that, so that way, we are able to reach that ultimate goal, like Paul says. If you will, just, just a couple pages to chapter 5. We can see that as we go throughout the chapter that Paul is telling us that we will never know when, when the Lord is going to come. He says in, in verse 2, For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. We see that we never know whenever a thief is going to break into our house. And that's what he is relating it to. We don't know whenever the Lord is coming. But then if we, if we jump down to, to, to verse 8. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet of hope of salvation. For, the God, for God has not destined us for wrath, but... A, but to obtain salvation through Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Like he says in verse 8, we have to be sober-minded. This doesn't just mean that you're not drunk, but that you have to be willing and able to have a clear mind while you're studying. If you don't have a clear mind and you're focused on other things that are not his word, you will gain nothing out of it. You will forget everything, and that is what he means by being sober-minded. And then in verse 11, therefore encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. We see here that if we aren't encouraging one another with this, and knowing that the day of the Lord is coming, nobody is going to build is going to be able to build themselves up. So this is why teamwork is so important to running. Because without one another, you, you won't gain anything. You won't become stronger. You won't become faster. You won't gain endurance. You will just forget all of it. You won't have any of it. <clears throat> so... Our, our brothers and sisters here and all around the world, just like we have, like we're supporting people from uh, Zimbabwe, Philippines, uh, 
Louisiana, Mexico, right? Mexico? We have all these people that we're supporting, but we're not just supporting them, we're also encouraging them so that they can also bring others to Christ. But we also need to be encouraging one another and building each other up and stirring each other up so that we can also bring uh, other people to Christ as well. And we need to remember that with the endurance and with this encouragement, we can ultimately reach that end goal of getting to heaven and seeing and praising God as we see throughout, throughout the, the book of Revelations and throughout Thessalonians. And we see that that is going to be such a great and awesome day whenever we are able to do that. But we need to make sure that we are helping each other get there. So, if you are, if you aren't running, I want you to ask yourselves, what can I do to better myself and to help encourage others so that they can ultimately get there with me? So are you running for that prize? If you aren't a Christian tonight, or you aren't running, or you've been slacking off and need encouragement, please come forward as we stand together and sing.